coming up on Legislative Review. And they deserve to have um, the information that's accurate, the toolkit to be able to make informed decisions to become healthy young adults. The House revisits comprehensive sex education for public schools. I think that if it's inappropriate for me to say on the dais, I, I'm, I don't think that that's something that I would want to teach a kindergartner. The Department of Ecology through rules and through a regulatory framework is establishing kind of the market. While in the Senate, greenhouse gas fuel standards moves ahead. Let's just for example at a 5% um, carbon reduction and a 20 cent gas tax increase. None of that 20 cents would go to the state of Washington. That's fair. And expanding the jurisdiction of youth courts gains traction. We've threaded the needle here to try to make sure that this is uh, addressing uh, diversions from juvenile court. Hello, I'm Troy Kirby with Legislative Review for Thursday, January 16th, covering the 2020 legislative session. This episode includes hearings on comprehensive sex education in public schools, low carbon fuel standards, and expanding the jurisdiction of youth courts. We obviously have a very popular subject for 8 o'clock in the morning. The House Education Committee held a public hearing on January 16th on House Bill 2184, which would bring comprehensive sex education to K-12 public schools in two years. Proponents included the Superintendent of Public Instruction's Lori Dill, who advocated for the bill, both in her role professionally and as a parent. The members of the group felt very strongly that this is an equity issue, that every single student around the state deserves exactly the same access to medically accurate, comprehensive information that protects people's health, um, especially given the rates of STDs that we're seeing increase dramatically over the last five years. And with our data summary, we did look at the last five years of data. We looked at trends, and we've seen an incredibly disturbing trend with a climb in STD rates in our state. They're going to be faced with choices that we cannot deny, and they deserve to have um, the information that's accurate, the toolkit to be able to make informed decisions to become healthy young adults. We are at the cusp of a culture shift that is necessary. Uh, it's not, you can't go by the headlines and not recognize that HR um, policies across the country and corporate worlds and even here on this campus have been reevaluated because um, we have um, an, an epidemic upon us where we are responding, I think, partly in this bill on a long term to um, ensure that we have an understanding of how we are to treat one another. Critics challenge the proposed standards, especially for children in early grades, K through three. A lot of people are very upset with having a standardized curriculum for K through three, uh, especially. I mean, uh, and when I looked at the curriculum, I, I'd be happy to read some of the stuff, but I will tell you, that I know that the chair would gavel me because it's a completely inappropriate for me to say here. And I think that if it's inappropriate for me to say on the dais, I, I'm, I don't think that that's something that I would want to teach a kindergartner. In Battleground, we, we actually purchased the FLASH curriculum and we shared it with the community. From describing the sex act to kindergartners, having nine-year-olds playing bingo with sex words, providing absolutely no failure rates or side effects for any of the birth control methods, to reading the step-by-step -step description of an orgasm, to a co-ed classroom of 14-year-olds, and many other examples. It was clear <coughs> it was not. And the community said no. Why not tailor this to the, to the secondary education system? Um, I've, I've looked at the data uh, to the representative called the air mentioned. The only plan that's been approved by OSPI that has K-2 education, those are, that's where the information's coming from. That's where those words are that we're not saying here on the dais. So why not focus on that area of you know, middle school through high school? Good morning, Mr. Good morning. Chair, members of the committee, for the record. The Senate Committee on Environment, Energy, Energy and, and Technology held a January 16th public hearing on Senate Bill 5412, which establishes a clean fuels program to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 2035. One of the things that I think is important to understand under the system is the Department of Ecology through rules and through a regulatory framework is establishing kind of the market, but by and large, this market is taking place between private entities. So they're trading credits, they're doing things internally within their business operations to achieve the reduction targets 
um, and to resolve that credit deficit situation under the clean fuel policy. During the bill's briefing, Senator Doug Erickson challenged staff about the cost to consumers. Under this proposal, how much of that anticipated additional cost that the consumer would be paying would go to the state of Washington in terms of additional um, fees to the, to the Treasury? So your question is, with respect to gas prices, if the prices go up, would there be fees that, w would well, any of those resources and, and, come and to Under your state? model here in terms of an LCFS, by definition, there's going to be fees paid to go into a system that, that, that pays for something. Where, where does the money go? How much of that money would go to the state of Washington? Again, it's, it's all on a private market type system. So the answer would be none of the money generated. So let's just, for example, at a 5% um, carbon reduction and a 20 cent gas tax increase, none of that 20 cents would go to the state of Washington. That's fair. Those testifying didn't share certainty that the bill would be an effective way to reduce CO2 emissions if enacted into law. Transportation is one of the largest source of greenhouse gases in Washington State and King County. Expanded transit and clean vehicle fuel and uh, clean vehicle and fuel options are key strategies for reducing transportation-related emissions. We are working with cities to make transit easier and faster and more frequent, and to expand um, driving alternatives. This will have significant impact, but to meet our climate goals, low carbon fuels need to be more widely available for public fleets and private consumers. We need state level policy to accelerate the reduction in carbon emissions and transportation related particulates that threaten the health of our residents in King County. This is um, an extremely inefficient way to reduce CO2. Seattle City Light spends about $7 per metric ton of CO2. I spend about $10 per metric ton of CO2 at carbon projects that I invest in through the Bonneville Environmental Foundation. In in Oregon, this costs $160 per metric ton of CO2. In California, $195 per metric ton. In other words, this wastes about nine out of every $10 it spends on CO2. We can do lots of other things that reduce CO2 far more efficiently than this. This is a bill that you heard before. It actually passed the Senate and the House last year, both but in different versions. The so Senate Committee on Human Services, Reentry, and Rehab looked at the jurisdiction of youth courts on Thursday, January 16th, with Senate Bill 5640, which is a substitute of two bills which passed both chambers in 2019, but in different versions, and also failed to reach the governor's desk. Like the previous bill, this expands the current youth court statute, which is for children aged 16 through 17 years old. It expands it to include civil infractions as well as uh, traffic and transit infractions. But also, uh, last year, your bill um, expanded it to go down to 12 years old, those 12 through 15 years old. Um, and this, this, this bill, this substitute bill does not do that, but it instead allows the youth court to function as a diversion uh, with a refer accept the referral from a diversion unit from a juvenile court so that um, co-jurisdiction would be held by the juvenile court and the youth court under certain conditions. The substitute bill works to ensure that the offender interacts directly with peers to take responsibility, giving back to the community instead of merely paying a fine. While you have one adult court youth court and juvenile court youth court, the, the combining of those two now has the protection for the juveniles that enter this kind of combined. It is rather unusual, I'll just say that very briefly, for a bill to have passed the House and passed the Senate and then to not reach concurrence. And so there were, um, you know, there was an issue raised at the very end about whether or not people would have uh, the ability, juveniles would have the ability to seal their records if it goes into an adult court. And so I think we have managed, we've threaded the needle here to try to make sure that this is uh, addressing uh, diversions from juvenile court. Thank you for watching Legislative Review for Thursday, January 16th. You can follow all of our stories digitally on Facebook and Twitter, as well as on TVW, including the entire Legislative Review at 8 p.m. and 11 p.m. daily throughout the 2020 legislative session. I'm your host, Troy Kirby.